Chapter 6, Types of Chemical Reactions and Solution Stoichiometry. So we're going to talk about, in 6.1, water, the most common solvent. We'll talk about the nature of aqueous solutions and strong and weak electrolytes. We'll talk about the composition of solutions. We'll talk about different types of chemical reactions, including precipitation reactions in 6.5. We'll describe reactions in solution, and we'll talk about the stoichiometry of precipitation reactions and we'll look at acid base reactions and then we'll do oxidation reduction reactions we are going to skip balancing redox reaction equations because we will do a better job of that when we talk about electrochemistry in the next course so why is a sugar solution not, a, not used as an electrolyte what kind of reaction we want to classify photosynthesis as so those are some of the kinds of questions that hopefully we'll be able to answer but let's start off with water Right, the common solvent, sometimes called the universal solvent. Water is an integral part of many life-sustaining reactions. We are bags of mostly water. Right? Cooling effect of water is used to reduce the temperature of car engines, nuclear power plants, industrial processes, and of course, while you are sweating, athletes. Right? So as you are moving around, sweat evaporates, it cools you down. It's used as a means um, of transportation, uh, President Lincoln is the only president to have a patent, and that was for some sort of barge-based apparatus, because he was a riverboat man for a while. It's vital to the growth of crops, and it is a polar molecule. That's part of why water is a liquid at room temperature, is because it is so polar, and it's able to engage in hydrogen bonding with these hydrogen atoms attached to this oxy oxygen with lone pair of electrons. Let's take a look at a picture of water dissolving salt. So if you've got sodium chloride, everybody's taken table salt and they've dissolved it in water. Well, the process of dissolution occurs because we have interactions between the water molecules and the ions that make up our sodium chloride solvent. So if we look at our water molecule, we've got a partial positive end and a partial negative end over here by the oxygen. And so the partial positive end is going to align towards the negative sodium anion, the partial negative end is going to align towards the uh, positive sodium, so our partial positive is going to align towards that sodium, and we'll end up forming an interaction between the solvent, that's the water, water is going to be the solvent, so we've got some solvent-solute interactions here that are going to be stronger than the interactions between the ions that make up our solid. So our lattice energy is going to be less than our energy that we get from dissolving that and forming this new bond or new interaction between the anion and the partial positive end of the water and between the cation, the sodium, and the partial negative end of the water. So individually, right, this plus minus between the sodium and the chlorine is going to be a much stronger bond than this partial bond, this partial positive, and this negative. But I've got many water molecules that are able to surround this anion, and many water molecules that are able to surround that cation. So the interaction between water molecules and the ions of salt is what causes dissolution. Salts are broken up into their individual cations and anions. So we consider the hydration of ammonium nitrate. We've got NH4 plus, this guy is our polyatomic cation, and nitrate over here, this is a polyatomic anion, in the presence of water, water is going to dissolve that into its component, cation and anion, right? And this AQ indicates that these are hydrated or solvated or dissolved ions. Our solubility is going to vary among different substances. So different things are going to dissolve into water to a different extent. Differences in solubility of ionic compounds is going to depend on the attraction of the ions to each other and the attraction of the ions to the water molecules. When an ionic solid dissolves in water, the ions undergo hydration and are dispersed. That means they're just going to spread out. Right, they're, they're free to move about the solution. Many non-ionic solids are also soluble, like sugar, right? Sugar is going to be soluble in water, right? Animal fat, for example, is not soluble in pure water, right? Because fat, right, it's got a lot of these hydrocarbon chains on it, right? And these guys are going to be non polar, whereas water is going to be a polar molecule, right? So this is a like-dissolves-like thing. So fat is not soluble in water. 
And that's why the cream in your milk rises to the top because cream is mostly fat. And so it's going to be on the bottom of the skim milk, which is mostly aqueous. Yep. So let's look at the solubility of ethanol in water. So ethanol, that is good old drinking alcohol. Right? I've got this part of the molecule here. If I just look at this part with the hydrocarbon, this part of the molecule is nonpolar. But I have this OH group on the top with a polar bond between hydrogen and oxygen, which is going to give me a partial positive and a partial negative end. And so this polar part of the molecule is able to interact with our polar water, where I've got a partial negative on my water and the partial positive on this hydrogen. And again, they're going to undergo some sort of H bonding, hydrogen bonding. And we'll talk about that in much greater detail in subsequent chapters in the next course. So our solute is the substance that is dissolved. Right? Our solvent is going to be, in this case, liquid water. When we're talking about electrical conductivity, it's the ability of a solution to conduct electricity. And you guys will do a lab on this, I think, where you're going to take some stuff and you'll dissolve it in solution, and then you'll try to get a little light bulb or an LED to light up. If it conducts electricity, light bulb goes on. If it's a non-conductor or a non-electrolyte, light bulb stays off. Solutions with high electrical conductivity are called strong electrolytes, and solutions with low electrical conductivity are called weak electrolytes. Non-electrolytes do not conduct electricity. Right? Electrolytes are substances which dissolve in water to produce conducting solutions of ions. And I already told you guys the amusing Gatorade story uh, about the first time they tried Gatorade as a replacement to what was lost during the sweating process uh, for University of Florida's football team. So one of those components in, in the sweat was sodium chloride. So sodium chloride solid, place it in water. So you can put the solvent up above. And sometimes you will see um, a little arrow with a delta over it. That means you're going to heat something. And so this is saying what you're going to add to this solution. So sodium chloride in water is going to give us sodium plus one cations and chloride minus one ions for our soluble ionic compounds. Non-electrolytes are substances which do not produce ions in aqueous solutions. So sugar yet will dissolve in water. I can go from solid sucrose into, solids, into aqueous sucrose, but it will not conduct electricity. According to Svante Arrhenius, the conductivity of a solution depends on the number of ions that are present. Strong electrolytes readily produce ions in aqueous solution. Weak electrolytes produce relatively small numbers of ions in solution. Um, so where are you going to... You are mostly familiar with strong electrolytes, right? Sodium chloride, right? If it's, gonna, it's an ionic compound and it dissolves, it's going to be completely dissolved, right? So it's going to split up into sodium plus and Cl minus. Well, not all of our ionic compounds will do that. For example, calcium... Hydroxide is not going to like dissociate a lot. It's just going to dissociate a little bit. Or something like a weak acid, where we've got uh, like hydrofluoric acid. Right? It's not going to dissociate into very many H pluses and F minuses, which are going to be charge carriers. So it's not going to produce a lot of our ions. Most of it's going to stay over here as HF. Most of it's going to stay as calcium hydroxide. Non-electrolytes, it doesn't matter how much they dissolve, they're still not going to conduct uh, ions in aqueous solutions. So something like ethanol or sugar, not going to produce ions. Right. And if you do the little experiment, something like sodium chloride will completely dissociate. It's a good conductor. Lots of ions are produced. Light bulb gets really bright. Something like sucrose over here or sulfur, dissolved sulfur, not going to have any ions in solution, light bulb will stay off. And then something like, oh, a weak acid, where I'm going to get a couple of ions, and something that's sparingly soluble, will conduct a little bit of electricity. Okay. Our strong electrolytes are compounds that dissolve to a large extent when dissolved in water, and our weak electrolytes dissolve to a small extent. So for example, hydrochloric acid completely dissociates into H plus and Cl minus, whereas acetic acid is mostly going to stay as acetic acid, and it's going to produce some H plus and a little bit of acetate. Right? And oftentimes we'll give it this double-sided arrow to indicate that that reaction can go in both directions. Right? So if I take H plus, say from dissolving HCl in solution, and I take acetate, say from sodium acetate, 
I will form a lot of this conjugate weak acid over here. We'll talk about conjugate acids and bases excuse me, later on. So strong electrolytes, completely ionized. Right? We call them soluble salts if they're going to be ionic compounds. Sodium chloride produces Na and Co minus ions when dissolved. Strong acids are, all, are a type of our strong electrolyte, but they're going to produce H plus ions when we dissolve them. So we're going to represent them in aqueous form in equations that completely dissociate into ions. So H2SO4, that's sulfuric acid, right, is going to produce two H plus ions under certain conditions. This first one here is going to act like a strong acid. And then it can lose that second one, this HSO4, will act like a weak acid. And it'll produce a little bit of H+. Plus. Right, so I'll draw that double-sided arrow. And some SO4-. minus. But going between the H2SO4 and the H+, plus, right, that's going to be a very, almost 100% efficient process. Right. Um, H2SO4, sulfuric acid, is the most commonly produced industrial chemical in the world. Um, and the way they ship it is kind of crazy. So you think about dissolving an acid in solution, right? You can take some solid and you're going you're gonna to mix it up. And they actually make this really funky uh, kind of super saturated solution with H2SO4 in water when they ship it just to save shipping costs. Um, strong electrolytes, strong bases will also act like strong electrolytes. Uh, so strong bases are going to be anything that is an alkali metal with an OH on it. Right? An alkali metal and an OH together. And so they're going to dissociate and form whatever your metal cation is. And then this part over here that's important, that's your OH minus. That's what makes it a strong base. Right? Bases generally tend to taste bitter. Uh, acids taste sour. Uh, bases tend to be slippery to the touch for a couple of reasons. One, you're changing the fats and oils on your fingers into soap. And that's how you make soap. You take lye, which is uh, potassium or sodium hydroxide, and you react it with the fat, and you saponify it and make a compound that has both a hydrophobic and a hydrophilic end. Uh, and the other thing is, that you're doing is you're starting to actually delaminate layers of skin. So your skin will start to slough off a little bit. So that's why bases can be slippery to the touch. Right. Substances that only produce a small amount of ions when dissolved could be classified as weak acids or weak bases or sparingly soluble salts. So uh, acetic acid is an example of a weak acid. Most of it, like 95% or more, is going to stay like this. A little bit will dissolve into H3O plus and acetate. And our bases that only produce a little amount of ions in aqueous solution. So ammonia is a weak base. It reacts with water to form ammonium, which is the conjugate weak acid. And then some OH minus, but not a lot of these. You know, it's going to still be like 90% plus as the NH3 form. And non-electrolytes are those that don't produce any ions when dissolved in water. So ethanol dissolved in water, the molecules are dispersed, but they don't break up into ions. The resulting solution is not capable of conducting electricity.